Louisiana's economy improved along with the American economy during the last years of peace. When the war began, Baton Rouge was already a major oil refining center owing to the Standard Oil Company of Louisiana Refinery. During the 1940s, this refinery and other major industries in Baton Rouge caused the city to become a vital cog in the nation's war machine. My father was Louis Price, and uh, he, was a, uh, he was an employee with Exxon, with Standard Oil in Baton Rouge, the Exxon refinery. He actually started working for him when he was 14 years old. He lied about his age, got a job at Exxon as, a, as a, uh, an office boy. And by night, going to night school and working in the refinery, he went through various steps in the refinery. And in 1936, he graduated from LSU with a, an engineering degree. Now, now back, back then, uh, uh, Standard Oil didn't really like to have LSU degreed engineers at, at the Baton Rouge refinery. They'd get people from MIT and Georgia Tech and so forth. So, but they knew, they knew my dad, so they hired him, and, and after that they began to hire LSU engineers. He worked on cr the creation of synthetic rubber, and he was also involved in the uh, use of catalytic converters to, uh, to process higher octane gasoline. The Standard Oil Complex, by the end of the war, included the first catalytic cracking plant ever built, which contributed heavily to the production of badly needed 100 octane aviation fuel and also created byproducts useful in making synthetic rubber. In addition, the complex housed an alkylation plant that made high octane blending agents for aviation fuel, plants synthesizing both ethyl and isopropyl alcohol, and plants that produce synthetic rubber. By June 1945, the government estimated that the refinery fueled one plane of every 15 used in the war effort. The Aluminum Company of America also operated a plant in Baton Rouge that reduced bauxite ore to aluminum used in aircraft and other construction. By April 1944, the facility produced enough aluminum for 2,000 fighter planes per month. Shreveport was the center of wartime prosperity in northwest Louisiana. The J.B. Beard Company employed approximately 800 people and produced shell casings, tanks for the production of synthetic rubber and storage of high-octane fuel, landing barge anchors, and armored tank parts. The Brewster Company received raw steel tubing, which it finished into 250-pound bomb bodies and shipped to shell-loading plants. The Shreveport Chamber of Commerce began lobbying the Army Ordnance Department in 1940 for a munitions plant, an effort that resulted in the announcement in April 1941 that the Army intended to locate a plant at nearby Minden. Despite problems encountered in construction, by 1943 the massive plant included 430 buildings scattered over 16,025 acres. New Orleans continued to be the state's busiest industrial area during the war years, producing a myriad of goods ranging from Liberty ships to tents. Ships were manufactured by Louisiana Shipyards, Delta Shipbuilding Company, and Higgins Industries. The B-cell shipyards built tugboats. You know, a lot of people don't think of a tugboat, you know, as having anything to do with the war effort, but they were vital. They helped to guide many of the larger ships into the ports right off the beaches at D-Day. Consolidated Volte Aircraft Corporation of Downey, California, also built the Consolidated Model 31 flying boat for the U.S. Navy in New Orleans. Smaller companies built other war-related products. Ream Manufacturing Company made 105 millimeter shell casings. The Neptune Boat and Davit Company built lifeboats. Edwin H. Blum manufactured military trousers. The Federal Fiber Mills produced manila and sisal rope. The Snyder Poster Process Company made decals that eliminated hand lettering of aircraft instrument panels and therefore speeded aircraft manufacture. The Crescent Bed Company manufactured beds for Liberty ships while the International Lubricant Corporation made special greases ordered by the armed forces to keep their equipment operating when exposed to seawater or extremes in temperature. My father, who volunteered to serve in the Army but was rejected because he had a chip bone in his ankle, of all things, uh, wound up working at a place called the Dixie Machine Works in downtown New Orleans. And Dixie Machine made precision tools all of the different types of tools and dyes and so forth for the creation of 
machinery, which in turn was used to manufacture almost anything from artillery to rifles and so forth and so on. The dominant war industry in the city, and indeed the entire state, was Higgins Industries owned by Andrew Jackson Higgins. During the 1930s, Higgins designed and built the Higgins Eureka, a 36-foot motorboat that could rush onto a beach without damage and then back away from the beach after unloading its cargo. Oil companies quickly adopted the boat for use in the marshes of Louisiana and other venues of oil production in other parts of the world. He would run those Eureka boats up onto the cement steps full speed and then back out to show how durable they were, to show their their uh, ability to, to go both onshore and then to pull away from that. But he also was such a great engineer, he could build very fast boats. So the Coast Guard is going to him and asking him, you know, we've it's prohibition, we got rum runners, so we start selling them boats. So he gets the bright idea, well, you know, I ought to let these rum runners know that maybe uh, they could use some boats too. So then he starts making boats for both the rum runners and the Coast Guard. By 1941, he was producing in his New Orleans shipyards landing craft based on the Eureka design, as well as ramp-type welded steel tank lighters and patrol torpedo or PT boats. In World War II, Beyond just those Eureka landing craft, he built troop transports. He built the fastest PT boat the Navy had. It's like a 70-foot PT boat that would do 40 knots with very um, good um, gas mileage. And he had, uh, he just built this array of things. And a lot of it comes out of what he learned in, in working with those boats in Prohibition and, and in the swamps. He was an engineering genius, not just designing boats, but also in production, which eventually during the war, he's producing everything from all these different kinds of boats, even planes, even uh, he developed a, uh, a lifeboat that B-17s would drop into the water for downed pilots. I mean, just they'd tell him a problem and he would fix it. By September 1940, Higgins Company employed approximately 400 production workers. By 1941, he employed about 1,800 workers and spent $700,000 monthly for Louisiana labor and products. By 1944, employees numbered about 20,000, black as well as white, in seven different manufacturing units in New Orleans. In all, the company sold more than 14,000 combat boats of all types to the Allies. In September 1943, the U.S. Navy reported that the majority of its 14,072 vessels were either designed or built by Andrew Jackson Higgins. We're here at another place in Louisiana that has a direct connection to World War II. This is the Southern Forest Heritage Museum at Longleaf, Louisiana. Well, you know, they say that the Higgins boats are the boats that won the war. Uh, they couldn't use just any wood underneath the base of the boat to give it strength. They had to have the pine and the longleaf pine was here in big enough pieces it could be taken care of, they could ship it down to them, and it was waterproof and it was resilient and it's just what they needed. So they actually cut the pine for the underneath portions of that Higgins boat right here at this sawmill. Uh, and I've heard that the people from the Higgins company would even come here and walk in the woods and pick out the trees that they wanted to use the people themselves were a vital part of the Florida Parish's contribution, but it was more than that. Um, uh, industries extracted things like timber, uh, cotton fiber that was used in the war industry was uh, very heavily used out of the Florida Parishes. In fact, the largest uh, cotton uh, gin production mill at Ameet, which was the Gillette Gin Company, was immediately converted over to war production. It began making specific parts for tanks and uh, certain types of artillery pieces. Um, a couple of fledgling oil companies emerged during that era, So, and they actually uh, hit on the Chapapila Ridge field there, and it was during World War II that they began to explore more. So oil was coming out of the area as well. In terms of natural resources and manpower, uh, the Florida Parish is completely geared up and became totally focused on the war effort as a means of economic and social salvation. Wartime prosperity came to southwest Louisiana, primarily at Lake Charles, which became an important petrochemical center. 
Industrial growth there began before the war, after the city in Calcasieu Parish began constructing a ship channel from Lake Charles to the Gulf of Mexico in 1921. Matheson Alkali Works invested about $7,500,000 in a new plant in 1933, followed by Swift Packing Company, which built a $2,500,000 plant. The availability of petroleum led Continental Oil Company in 1939 to construct a vast $5 million complex, including an oil refinery, a tank farm, and a pipeline to transport crude oil from large oil fields in the vicinity. Louisiana oil fields also went to war. Louisiana oil operations, spurred on by the national defense effort, drilled about 200 holes in 1941 and discovered 29 new fields, bringing Louisiana's known oil reserves officially to 925,972,000 barrels, third in the nation. Louisiana's production of crude oil rose from 214,888,995 barrels in 1940 to 41 to 275,709,168 barrels in 1944 to 45. Shortages of labor and steel for oil field production caused the number of oil wells drilled during 1942 to drop to 137. By 1943, however, Louisiana's approximately 7,300 wells spread over 46 parishes and produced 8% of the entire United States output. A composite index of Louisiana business activity using the activity of the average month of the period 1937 to 1939 as a base number of 100 reveals that the overall index stood at 105.2 in 1940, 130.3 in 1941, 179.3 in 1942, 205 in 1943, and 210.4 in 1944. Population increase occurred primarily in the urban industrial areas and the training camp areas of the state. Greater New Orleans, for example, grew by 64,463 between 1940 and November 1945. Greater Shreveport grew by 17,775 during the same years, while Baton Rouge grew by a phenomenal 75,281, Alexandria and Pineville by 28,756, and Lafayette by 5,790. The World War II years marked a fundamental shift in which employment offices quit attempting to find a job for every worker and instead frantically sought to find a worker for every available job. And while the war did not completely industrialize Louisiana's economy, it set the economy on the road to industrialization, a trend that the state shared with the rest of the South. So there was plenty of opportunity in the case of Rural Louisianians in southern Louisiana, they migrated into the cities, faced housing shortages, but they could have all the skilled work that they wanted, as well as free training to get it. So for sharecroppers and others outside the city during the war, they had money in their pockets for the first time. And that was a tremendous change.